Oh boy, today's episode is amazing. Dr. John Deloney, he just wrote a book, it just dropped, Building a Non-Anxious Life. This guy is a best-selling author. He's the host of the Dr. John Deloney Show. He's also a great friend of ours. I don't know if the boys and I told you recently, but we uh, we love you, buddy. And we want we to appreciate do some, you. something small for you. Shut up. Uh, we, uh, we appreciate you. You're one of our you. favorite people, and you've treated us so incredibly and connected yeah. us with so we want to do <laughs> situations. So we want to get you some, man. It's yeah. amazing. Open it up, dude. Oh, so many? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the protein bars. The great we left it up to Justin uh, to pick Shut out. Shut up, dude! Yeah. What's the matter with you guys? Holy I smokes! Saw you throwing around the Jackson. Dude, my Jackson, bridge, man! So I was like, golly! No one spoke to me. I was like, oh, dude. Guys. Yeah. Yeah. This means the world, man. Can we hug? Is that weird? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For yeah. sure. Bro. <laughs> there you go, man. We love you. Well, now we're gonna see you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm not putting this down. We're just gonna hug with it. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, man. Golly, Jackson's man. Dude. Dude. I'm stoked to see you. Yeah, we don't think it's weird dude. if you want to interview holding it, dude. So yeah, I'm not gonna. <laughs> <laughs> now you have to play us a song. Yeah. Yeah. Your own little yeah. shit. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, Extremely insightful, but down to earth. He communicates in a way that's understandable and effective. When it comes to mental health, navigating your life and your relationships, this guy is the man. So we know you're going to love this episode. Today's program giveaway, the original MAPS program, MAPS Anabolic. If you want to win that program, leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. We also have a sale going on. MAPS bands, half off, and the Hard Gainer bundle, half off. Both half off. If you're interested in either one, Click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. John, welcome back. Thanks, man. It's good to see you guys. Yeah, you too, bro. Yeah. One of our favorite people, uh, for sure. And I do want to share this on the podcast. You were so um, incredible and gracious to me. We, we came and, and saw you at a, a massive event, and uh, I told you I was struggling with some stuff. You took me backstage, sat down with me, and talked with me yeah. for like an hour, man. That was incredible. Very impactful, too, so I appreciate that. Um, your book... I don't think it could have come out at a more perfect time. The title is The Non-Anxious Life. And uh, all the data on anxiety is showing that it's getting worse. Yeah, It's getting worse in every age group. Every Is that why you wrote the book? Or why did you write the book? Who's it for? I mean, to be honest with you, I didn't. that wasn't the goal, right? I wanted to write a book on parenting. I think a lot of parenting books aren't that great. I wanted to write a book on making friends when you're 40 because there's nothing out there for us. Mm -hmm. And um, a couple of years ago... Um, I was on air and somebody was calling about anxiety, anxiety, anxiety. And I finally said, hey, anxiety is not your problem. Anxiety is just trying to get your attention. you got this other stuff in your life going on. And I took the headphones off and my co-host Dave took the headphones off and he looked at me and goes, you need to write that down. I'd never heard that. And I thought everybody knew that. And so I wrote a teeny tiny little 60 page book and it shot out from underneath us in a pretty wild way. Right. And so as we sat down with the team, they're like, hey, the world's gone mad. And I didn't want to, I want to keep talking about anxiety. I'm kind of tired of talking about it. As I was writing this, um, I realized why about halfway through my wife and I had a confrontation. I checked into a hotel and I realized, oh, I'm not living this. Mm. Like, I don't want to deal with this because I'm heading down a bullet train. I've been down before myself where I was such an anxious mess. I almost blew up everything. And so it became more of me lecturing society because i'm so smart mm. and more like hey i'm pulling up a bar stool and like like pour me one too because we got to figure this out and um yeah w w it's a mess it's what, a mess what was that process like because that's a it was hard vulnerable yeah it was hard because i like that's, that's what i do right i tell everybody how to do it mm -hmm. and um it was hard when my wife said uh I, i'm watching my husband die right in front of me and mm. um chasing all this stuff and I don't know what to do, but I love you. And I don't know what to do. And that was a humbling, that was a humbling moment. What is it about anxiety that makes it so addictive? It has to be right. Because we, we know we don't like it. We know it's not good for us. It causes us to, or at least uh, in the way that we experience it or how addictive we. Addictive or crippling. Yeah. You know, well, it's, it's crippling, but it's also, it feels addictive. It feels like yeah, we're seeking it out. There, there's, there's kind of like some chicken or egg in the, in the literature. And I don't like to get caught up in that. Sure. And, and who comes first, but there's an idea out there that you get addicted to 
the cortisol and the adrenaline, you, you get addicted to your body's chemical response. Mm -hmm. There's also out there, you get addicted to your numbing device of choice. And so your body will spin up the system so it will get that drink. Wow. So it'll get that wow. food. It'll get what it wants downstream. Either way, I don't care. Um, Judd Brewer's done some great work on it. It's You get addicted to the ramp up and you get addicted to the the deceleration, if that's even a word, you get you get to the off ramp and you just get in that cycle, man. And uh, when we have this constant stream of you're not okay, you're probably gonna die. It's all coming down. The economy's gonna do this. It's, man, your body's just getting it 24 seven, 365. You say you don't care which one it is as far as which one came first. Is that because you're not even really addressing the root cause and it's like it's not the the argument to be had? Like I've had a. I say I don't care for two reasons. One, I have had a humbling last 36 months, last three years. I spent 20 years in academics. I spent 20 years having lunch with some of the smartest minds in the world. And then getting out of that ecosystem, out of the university ecosystem and sitting with single moms and truck drivers just want to be better dads. I've realized, dude, I've been talking over people for 20 years. And if I sit down with a with a dad who's just saying, I don't my dad left and I want to be this thing called a dad, I don't even know what it is. And I'm like, well, the studies say he he's out. Mm -hmm. Can you help me right now, please? Right. And so for me, I don't I like the studies are important because it informs the 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 advice you give, right? And it informs how you pull up a seat next to somebody. What I'm finding is most people, most of the time, they know the next step. It's so terrifying to go alone. So will you just sit with me? While I tell my husband, I know you've been cheating on me. Will you sit with me why, while I, the doctor tells me I got cancer and we figure out what comes next. And so that's the first one. Um, so it's, that's more of a personal thing. The second one is it, it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the, the root cause, how we get out of this system is going to be the same, mm -hmm. whether it's X or Y. It's let's change the ecosystem and the alarms will stop ringing, man. Yeah. Is it solvable? Is it something that you can work with and is the right term build a different or better relationship with, or is it something you can make go away? Like, yeah. So the analogy I use, and I try to distill them all down into a picture I can give somebody from my son who's 13 all the way up to somebody in a nursing home who's never dealt with. It. So the picture I like to paint is anxiety is just a smoke detector in your kitchen. That's it. And in our current ecosystem, we've created this world where we're so afraid of discomfort everything we're, we've pathologized any negative anything you should be heartbroken if your mom passes away you should be heartbroken if you get dumped but we have a pill for that we have a solution for sure. that we've got a 12 point program to get rid of that feeling and so we've created a world where when we feel anxious when those alarms go off in our kitchen we climb up on a ladder and pull a battery out <laughs> and that and we say it's solved and the alarm shuts off it does man we can shut the alarms off with any number of drugs any number of behaviors but then your house burns down around you. And so what I want to do is say, what if we dealt with the fires in the front yard or in the back bedroom or in the kitchen or in the, in the bathroom, the alarms will go off. And by the way, I don't want to live in a house without a smoke detector. I don't want that world. And so anxiety plays an important role in our lives. It's letting you know, Hey, your body's detected. You're not okay. You're not safe. Let's figure that out. Not go to these wild gymnastic links to shut the alarms off. Just so we can connect with people listening right now. Cause I, this is me by the way. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I have issues with anxiety for sure. And I've only recently realized mm. that I have issues with anxiety. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't like negative feelings. I don't like feeling bad. So I'll do things to make myself not feel those feelings, whether it be reach for a substance mm -hmm. or avoid or, um, ignore or distract. What are the more common ways that people or behaviors, I should say that people use, to get away from bad feelings? What are the, like pulling the battery out? Like, what does that look like for most people? Yeah, so there's a lot of literature out there that say women are infinitely more anxious or infinitely more depressed, if you will. I happen to think depression and anxiety is on the same trend line, um, but that's a, that's a whole other podcast. But when you look at, as Terry Real did the great work to look at, if you look at the prison population, that's mostly men. And if you look at violence interactions, that's mostly men. What if anxiety responses look different across genders? What if they look different mm. um, given a set of genetic genetics, right? So I think for you and me, anxiety may look like a, a, a common way to pull the battery out may look like going to the gym, mm. flexing on somebody, feeling mm. powerful. Mm. Like uh, they call it the one up position. Like where can I rage and, and, 
and flex. For my wife, it might be shutting the whole system down, right? It might be that heart rate won't stop. And so I'm going to go eat. I'm going to go um, just scroll mindlessly. I'm going to distract myself. For some, it's another, it's another drink, another drink. For many, it is that feeling of aliveness. I'm anxious. I'm anxious when I walk home into my house because your body knows that your marriage is falling apart. So I text that woman back that I work with and like, I haven't crossed the line, but my, my heart rate goes up a little bit as though I was dating again. Right. And I chase that sense of aliveness. And then you end up doing stuff that you never planned on doing. Right. Mm -hmm. But you just start heading down this path. Some people go to work for 140 hours a week and they try to outachieve it. Right. They try to run, keep moving down the hallway away from that alarm until that fire moves to the next room, to the next room. And it'll, it'll eventually burn your house down. So it's any number of things. And that's where I think the diagnostics aren't super helpful because do you have anxious thoughts that you can't control? Do you have um, no thoughts at all? Right. I mean, it, it, it's <laughs> yeah. just, it, it looks different for everybody. And I think that's, that's why it's hard to play whack-a-mole with it. And so what if we just stop talking about the alarm system? What if we start talking about let's fix our lives so that our lives are whole and can handle what's coming? Um, Cause there's always something coming. Yeah. Let, let, let's talk about the, the work and working out one because of all the ones that you just listed, I find that to be probably one of the more challenging ones to figure out. Do I have a bad relationship with this or is this healthy? Because those things obviously are, are positive, right? Yeah. You got to go to work to, to feed your family. Uh, working out and exercise is healthy for your body. Um, but I do think that we actually see this a lot in our space. In fact, some of the people that I think we most admire in the fitness space that are the most famous for the way they look um, have found a way to get famous from this issue that they have. Mm -hmm. They've buried themselves into their physiques and they're so good at it. Mm -hmm. They can present that and outwardly, they look like they have it all figured out, but inside they're probably a terrified child. So how does somebody, how do you tell somebody or how do you help somebody become aware th that it, this thing that you claim to be healthy for you uh, isn't that healthy? How do they know? How do they become aware of that? Is this a behavior you continue to do despite negative outcomes also. Oh. And so um, working out is almost always good for me. And a few days ago, I wasn't feeling great, but I got to get my workout in mm. and I fell off a cliff, yeah. right? And I ended up sick, like it wasn't smart. And my wife said, oh, so you're being classic John again, huh? Where, and, 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 and often when you're with, you're with somebody in tight spaces, you can see somebody heading down a road before you get there, right? But it's the same as like having really great friends and colleagues and coworkers that are women or that are handsome guys. Y'all are great friends. And then y'all start texting. And then your spouse comes home and you flip your phone over. Now I'm continuing something that I know is going to have negative ramifications, but right, I'm down another road. So I think all behaviors are that way. There's something fun about getting with your buddies and getting a couple of drinks and kind of putting your nutritional ideas in a box and throwing it in the ocean and just getting chips and queso out. That's cool. There's also the, when you'd find yourself doing it by yourself, right? And doing it again and then doing it again. And so I think it's some, all those behaviors can have some good to them. It's when you do them, despite the fact that there's some negative consequences. It, how much value it, cause you mentioned your wife. And, that's addiction, by the way. That's, a, that's, that's, that's the definition of it. Right, right. Oh, I totally. Know, I think what, that I'm seeking for, cause when you think of like work and working out, there's such a fine line there, right. Of like someone. And I think what I see when people struggle with it on either one of those is you, you do a good job of justifying, justifying those two. Mm -hmm. It's other addiction, oh, other yeah. addictive yeah, things are, are hard to justify. Yeah. Like, Oh, well, yeah, I got, just got to do a line of Coke every day. Like there's, <laughs> right, right. because it makes me a better, no, it's real, but you can do a lot obvious. But if your, but if your drug is achievement, if your drug is busyness, sure. Yeah. I got a pastor in town, uh, in Nashville. that says, if busyness is your drug, rest will feel like stress. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so a That's line a of Coke way. The thing about Coke is it works for a while, right? <laughs> so if you've got a big project due that's going to get you this accolade and this stamp and you've identified achievement and money as you're like, you'll, you'll figure out a way to make Coke make sense for you for a while, right? right. right? So we'll, 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 we'll figure out a way to justify anything, yeah, yeah. right? That's where I think it's important to have other people uh, in I was just going to ask that because yeah. you mentioned your wife and, um, you know, we're constantly told don't listen to anybody. Just listen to yourself. Stupid. Everybody's, Stupid. Yeah. So, cause, cause had you not had your wife point that out? My, this has happened to me in my relationship where my wife will point something out and I just want to deny it. No, you don't know what you're mm -hmm. talking about. And I'm like, wait, this person really cares about me and loves mm -hmm. me. Maybe I should listen. 
And that helps with awareness. Like how important is it to listen to people who are around you that you care about, that you trust? Man, I'll say it this way. Your body would be failing you if it recognized you've got nobody looking over your right flank and your left flank. You got nobody watching over the hill over there and it let you sleep all night. It would be failing you. Your body would be failing you if it recognized you're lonely and let you have a deep, private, intimate time with somebody you care about. It's not time for sex. It's time to not die. And so you hear people popping up at 3 a.m. night after night after night. That's your body working exactly as it's supposed to. It doesn't want you asleep because it's identified threats everywhere, mm -hmm. right? And so we've created the loneliest generation in human history. Y'all talk about, I mean, we know this. And then we're surprised that our body's alarms are ringing off the hook all the time. Mm -hmm. And then you dump that, I don't call it bro science, but you dump that, they don't get it. You're like, you don't let her talk to you that way. Yeah. But that's, that's insane. Mm -hmm. It's insane. No Navy SEAL goes to war by themselves. No football team goes out there without coaches up in the box, the eye in the sky, watching to see what you can't see. That's insane. None of us do that in any other parts of our life, except when it comes to, you don't know me, bro. She does know you. Hmm. And she's watching her husband die right in front of her. He does know you. That's your best friend. And he said, man, I don't like where this is headed. And so I, I think it's madness to do life. And I think there's, there's, there's circles, right? There's, uh, in my life, um, this is from an exercise a counseling professor gave us that, man, it sent me off the rails. I've identified six people. And if you think about like a box I put on my, on my kitchen table, I got five men and my wife and I've given them permission. You speak in, you see something from afar, you see something up close. I've given you permission to call and say, you're not all right. Hmm. And then there's a peripheral, right? There's another 20 or 30 guys that y'all are in that. If you called me and said, hey, I saw you post something, take it down. That's not right. I would trust you've earned that trust with me, right? And so I would say, let's talk about it. But I, I, I trust you guys, man. Y'all are see because y'all don't want ill for me, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think we've now got five hundred thousand followers on Instagram. We let everybody speak in, and so now the cool overcorrection is, it's just me, bro. You oh. do you, and I just think that's a terrible way to live, man. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a nonsensical mm -hmm. way to do life. You mentioned that we're the loneliest generation, and when I think about that. Um, you know, we can look at the data and there's definitely growing loneliness and anxiety in everybody. But I, I, I mean, just from personal experience and also from what I've read, the two um, types of people that I see struggling with this are um, men over, let's say, middle-aged men. We just don't go out and make friends. We just don't. Men are terrible at this. And um, stay-at-home moms because they're with kids all day long and they don't go and talk to anybody. And what are the, what are the strategies? What, what, you know? Well, there's, there's a reason why if you get together with the old guys, everybody just tells the old football stories over. <laughs> and when you're around a group of veterans, they just get around and they tell the old member win stories. Like a couple of my closest buddies on planet earth, my, we were in a high school band together. We were going to make it, man. We were incredible. <laughs> and then we like took it into college. When we get together, all we talk about is, you remember that show? Remember that time you jumped off? The thing? Here's the deal. <laughs> For almost all of us, that was the last time we were part of something bigger than ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden we turned 40. Yeah. And you had a kid, you got married, you moved away. And then, you know, Ned Flanders next to me in his loafers and black socks, pulling his trash can out to the curb. He's like, hey, uh, man, we didn't, we didn't do a concert together. We didn't, we didn't <laughs> yeah. go shoulder to shoulder against yeah. that other team in the high school championship together. We didn't go to war together. And we don't have a, we don't have a plan B for that. Mm. And so we shut it down. We shut it down, man. And that's that quiet life of desperation. We land the plane in our own living room and our kids learn, don't say that because dad gets mad. And then suddenly they become responsible for the emotional regulation of the adults in their life, which is not their job. Don't say that mom gets mad. Don't do that, man. Dad's going to get pissed. And so they learn to make little internal lives of their own and they and the whole system starts over mm. again do you for them. Do you think that we find ways to, to cope or patch it up that are probably not the healthiest. For example, we did an episode, um, I don't know, maybe a month or two ago, and we, we talked about uh, video game addiction. And oh boy, don't make that mistake. Oh, we said a lot of things on there <laughs> that people, people do angry. that aren't great. Yeah. 
Video games was just one of the points. We got all the all the negative hate we got was for video games. Yeah, like and it and obviously like a lot of guys were like, "Don't touch my video games, yeah. man." And so, and what I th what came to mind right away, I have for I used to game when I was younger, and folks, I gained all the way and played video games till my late twenties. And how'd that make you feel? That I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, my older friends let me know. You know what I'm saying? Mm. That's when I finally woke up and realized, oh, okay, I do have to kind of grow up a little bit, which by the way, just me saying that's going to piss off a lot of people. <laughs> no, uh, hey. it, it, it triggers a lot of people for sure. And I, you know, <laughs> I'm going to get us all in trouble. Hey, I know. <laughs> I'm going to put it on you. I'm I'm gonna, John said it, not me. I'm so I will. I'm all right. Uh, there's this, there's this, and I get it because there, like you just said, that, that literally, like you described probably all of our lives. I know for sure, Justin, I can really connect to that. Like we're friends move away. We had this great yep. thing together for sure. I was laughing too. Yesterday I was on the phone with an old high school buddy. And of course he brings up like, you know, football and basketball stories from high school. And I'm just like, really? We're fucking 40 some years old. <laughs> we're still talking about this, but that just highlights that. And I think that a lot of those guys, uh, including myself at one point, find other comrades online and then we get together on on call of duty and we feel like we're accomplishing something mm -hmm. important together mm -hmm. but we're probably really yeah, not it's level four yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so zombies together. go with me here and i'm this is a working theory so it, it may fall apart okay we were talking about it in the car yesterday okay i think we don't have a roadmap and this word gets beat to death and i understand that and i understand especially with men they instantly roll their eyes i get it we have no roadmap for what entering into a vulnerable relationship with somebody else is. And if somebody looks at you and says, I'll take a bullet and go first. Somebody says, I'm going to hit that guy so you can run by me with a ball. Call it what you want. That's a vulnerable relationship. I'm oh, putting yeah. myself out there so that you can, mm -hmm. you can get this thing and we can all win, right? Without that roadmap, we've created a world where we try to have B without doing A. Here's what it looks like. What's gambling? That's participation without ever getting on the field. Mm. I don't have to work out. I don't have to build camaraderie. I don't have to fail. I don't have to get hit in the mouth. I just sit in the casino and I get just flooded with dopamine without mm. all the other participation. That's video games. Let's don't all get in our cars and get in a room and solve a problem. Let's don't go over to Justin's house and help him with his plumbing. We're going to figure it out. There's going to be stuff everywhere. We're going to have level one, level two. Yeah. Let's just sit in our house and put our little... Thing. That's pornography. Instead of sitting with somebody and saying, it's going to feel weird. There's a human in front of me, right? We're making eye contact. There's no. sounds. There's, <laughs> if you're Adam, right? Like, <laughs> like, like, like you, let's just bypass all that and let's just go straight. To, and so we've created this world where we're trying to hack and end around the hard, uncomfortable, complicated thing that is the beautiful hole on the other side of it. Mm. And we've just, we're just, it's hack after hack after hack, man. John, mm. I, this, so this is a kind of a personal question too, but connected to what you're saying is how do we, or how do I get comfortable with being uncomfortable? How do I get comfortable or develop a relationship with bad feelings where I don't instantly avoid uh, or, you know, detach or numb? So how, how would you answer that question if I asked you, Hey, like squatting hurts. How do I, but I want to do squats. Yeah, I know the answer to that. Go, go, go <laughs> practice. Yeah. Practice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you practice with somebody that you trust. And so my wife and I have had to create a language, man, which is I'm being vulnerable here or a story I'm making up is, and uh, she sent me something hilarious yesterday, which was, uh, uh, it was like a Instagram meme and somebody texted their spouse and said, hope, hope you have a great day. And then a few minutes later, and I saw the way you tied your shoes this morning and I feel like you're really mad at me. <laughs> Is that true? Right. And she was like, sorry, that's me. Right. It was, it was a funny exchange, but I can see my wife head out the door in a certain way and shut the door with, with a certain vigor. And I just start making up stories. Oh, she's just going to be mad today. After I'm the one working like that. I could just say, Hey, story I'm making up. You slam the door on the way out. I did something. And she can say, I really had diarrhea and I'm trying to get to it, right? It could have nothing to do with me. Right. It almost never does. But so we've had to decide in our house and, and dude, any couple, it could be, we, we, we do problems. We, we get naked and we sit across tables. There's like, it's just already, already awkward. So there's no problem weirder than this, right? Mm -hmm. You hear some couples will sit on the same side and they'll put the problem on the table. I don't care what it is. Come up with something that says, I'm going to practice this. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, do squats with no bar first. I'm going to do squats with a stick. I'm going to hold it. 
Then I'm going to move to the bar. Then I'm going to slowly start adding weight to this thing. And that might be the story I'm making up is, which turns into, hey, a few years ago, and I'm still hanging on to this, mm. to, hey, I had some abuse when I was a kid. I never told you. Like it, I mean, you, build your, you build yourself up to it. Mm. And then you get to a place where she's so ride or die. He's so ride or die. Your buddies are so... I don't think there's anything that any one of y'all couldn't bring to the other guys and say, mm -hmm. hey, yeah. I need to step away for a few months. I'm struggling with X and y'all didn't know it. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. You'd have to get over the initial, why didn't you come to us earlier? Mm -hmm. I feel like you lied to us. But then there's the, we got your six. We'll be here, right? And that's just practice and practice and practice. And I think you only practice by showing up, man. You just got to keep showing up and showing up and showing up and showing up. How um, often do you notice that um, like a lot of the negative side of anxiety is caused by like the stories you just are creating out of your own mind about situations or uh, events that occurred and uh, you don't really communicate well enough to uh, realize that there's really not a problem that you're creating a problem in your own mind, which then perpetuates this sort of anxious so feeling. I used to think that was the, the cornerstone was if I can stop making up stories and there's a component to that. The more we learn about the nervous system, the more I realize um, I'll make up a story, not about my old man, but I'll pretend it's him. Um, dad pulls up the driveway and I'm six and I just know it's smarter for me just to finish what I'm doing and go in my room and shut the door. It's safer in there. Or I hear dad drive up and I'm going to go just be uh, an ass. I'm going to say, look over here so he doesn't start wailing on mom, right? Mm -hmm. Your body puts a GPS pin in that, in that car driving up the driveway, game on, the, here we go. And then you fast forward 30 years and your wife drives up and you find yourself without mm -hmm. even thinking, I'm just starting to fold up, wipe my hands and I head into the bedroom, head into the bathroom, shut the door, pull my phone out and I still on the toilet for 45 minutes. That's not I feel a being like mm, they're calling me out right now. Right? That's, that's, that's not a story. You're <laughs> not like, is. you're not weak of character. You're not sure. weak of morals. Your body has said, not safe. I detected it for you, even mm. detected it, and we're going to head out. It's it's beginning to become aware, and that's, man, you hear the word mindfulness. We kind of think of an old dude on a cloud with a beard, like, sitting like that. Yeah. It's just being curious. John, it, I've read this from the neurological standpoint, because you mentioned this, the nervous system. It literally circumvents the frontal lobe. Rational think. Yeah, so the part of the brain where I'm aware yeah. and I can act out irrationally, that comes online after the feelings happen. Your body doesn't want you asking, I wonder if that's a really sweet, pettable tiger. <laughs> they just want you to run, man, yeah. and pick up a stick and fight. Yeah. We'll figure out if that's pettable later, right? It, it can't take that risk. And so, mm -hmm. man, if your mom and dad weren't safe, or y'all have had, uh, been talking attachments recently, which I love. Yeah. yeah. If your body attributes attachment A to that relationship, that's going to follow you until you get curious and say, how come every time my wife, somebody I know who loves me, how come every time my coworkers show up, guys I love and we run with, why do I always, why does my body start to head south? Let's stop it there. And that's the work, man. That's now, the practice. To use the squat analogy, just because we have listeners right now that, that have heard me talk about this or us talk about this, you develop a recruitment pattern and that's your default recruitment pattern. And the more fatigued you are, the more you're going to rely on that recruitment pattern. The more stress you're under, mm -hmm the more that that old recruitment pattern is going to come out. And the only way to to uh, break free of it, if it's one that's, let's say, hurting your knees or your back, is to start slow and retrain a brand new recruitment pattern to the point where it becomes your default. Mm. Is that similar to what we're talking about, where you're trying to get that, let's get this CNS to react differently. It's going to have to take some time, practice, and get it to that's it, man. the same thing. And, and, and I think... I'm not one who blames everything on social media. Um, I just don't think the data is bearing that out. But you can only scroll through so many times to see David Goggins just being like, just go snap. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's cool to know what the human body can do. That's awesome. Like, I'm tired. No, nah, you're not. Right? That's important. Sure. But it's equally important if you want your kids to want to come home, like when they're teenagers, if, if you want to be a safe place for them to land when they get sideways in their life and they're going to get sideways, Man, that works. Mm. Learning how to, to reshift and become a safe house is important, man. Let, let's get even more tactical to what kind of Sal was asking. Because, <clears throat> okay, I'm a 40-something-year-old man. Say I have I, I don't have any friends other than my Call of Duty game that I play. I recognize, I hear you out. I recognize that I need to do better about building relationships. I'm uh, Whether I believe it or not, uh, subconsciously, I'm terrified. 
to do that. I'm terrified of like, I don't have any desire to go to some nightclub with the music and like doing that. I don't want to go on some weird website that links me up, but I know I have people. I have people that I know that I like, right? Let's, let's use you for an example. Let's say we live in the same town. Does that look like, okay, I need to do this. So I start really small to the squad analogy. And it's like, I'm going to call John and see if he just wants to have a cup of coffee with me. Is that, is that like, what are the tactical the two, steps? The two, the two things I've figured out and guys, this isn't, this isn't, out of, there's no data on this that I can find. This is John Deloney trying to figure out moving to a new state when he's 40 okay. and had some ride or dies and now I'm all by myself, right? This is me trying to figure it out. The two things I'd tell you to do is go first. And the second one is just be weird. <laughs> That's it. Hey, um, you three guys, grab whoever you want to grab, grab your kids, and come over to my house, whatever you got left in the fridge, every Monday night. We have clean-up fridge night at my house. You got half a bottle of wine. You got half of a weird casserole that I don't even know. Like, let's, we'll eat it if it's not. But we're all going to make fun. And I'm not cleaning my house. Just come over. Two of y'all won't come, and it will be awkward. And then maybe the second time, a couple of y'all will come. And then in a few months, like, we'll connect. You two yahoos, like, I mean, y'all are cool, but, it, like, like we'll connect and that's just, it's just an organic process that way. Yeah, I, know. I think we put so much pressure. We're so obsessed with ROI for every second and every minute, mm. by the way, you get into like the, the alarms ringing. We've got calendars in our lives that are so stacked. And if you get five minutes off meeting one, your, your week can't recover. And so it does mean I've got to go kind of like, you know, people come in and say, Hey, my, my heel hurts. And then you watch them squat and it's like, well, that starts in your neck, my friend. Like mm. you are under that bar in a weird way that is compressing this and your body's overcorrecting here and moving here. Anxiety is the same way. If you owe somebody $500,000 in a mortgage and cars and your investments that you leveraged here to try to, to beat the interest rate gap over here, your brain would be failing you if it let you sleep all night. Because it knows if Sal says one thing and it goes out and this show gets canceled, <laughs> there's no rent. There's no food. There's no cars. It would be failing you, right? If um, your marriage is falling apart, man, you can sit two inches from each other on the couch, but your body knows you're 2,000 miles away. It's going to sound the alarm until you solve that problem. And so, again, I think you're. we're always trying to solve over here the problems over here, man. Yeah, I wonder, too, if it's like, <clears throat> like we don't even, maybe we don't value it as much as we should. Right, like the no, import, like the building, the like building that, starting that. I think Dude, we're, our whole culture says you can't. I know. I, if so this I, happened to you when you were a kid, if you're the wrong color in the wrong place, right, if you right. feel this, you can't. I got to come save you. Yeah, and I and I feel like, like so I don't feel like I, this is something I struggle with, but I still think I could be better. Right, I think mm -hmm. all of us, if if, if relationship building mm -hmm. in real life, in person, solving pro problems with other men that are like minded that I like is that extremely valuable to our health even i can do better even i can do more of that and i have like i have a buddy who's probably and we are, it's a mutual friend of ours probably lives uh 15 minutes from my house love his wife love his kids he's one of the best human beings i every time i see him i have a, a good time yet we find excuses of why we're so busy all the time to not connect because of our calendars and stuff and yet it's so easy to just and it's like if I really, if I really listed out like the things that f filled my soul, that get, that made me healthy, that made me a better dad, made me a better husband, made me a better human, for sure, having relationships with people like that, be that. Yet somehow I justify, you know, the lawn being mowed or the, uh, you know, the thing I need to read for the you know, podcast episode. We're gonna, like all these other things somehow still make it a above on my list. Yet I know that. What, what is Here, that? Here's the bigger picture. The greatest gift you can give your kids is not going to every single t-ball game. The greatest gift you can give your kids is to be a non-anxious presence in that living room. Mm -hmm. And so if it means skipping a soccer game once a week to go help your neighbor fix his fence and y'all laugh like crazy ah. and he's got cheap beer and, and pizza and y'all laugh and figure it out and the fence is kind of wonky in certain places and it, and you come home with a smile on your face and that nuclear reactor right here is is down a little bit. And your kid comes home, how'd it go? Dad, I crushed it. It's not an excuse to abandon your kids. That's not what I'm saying. To end up at like cheers at the bar. No, you're, bro, you're hitting it right on the head right now. But it's so good. We are so obsessed with what are they going to think? What are they going to think? The greatest gift you can give your kids is you go have friends. Mm. Cassiopo did all the work, man. You can look at the loneliness data, dude. It's brutal. It's brutal. 
problem is there's no money to be made off solving for loneliness. I'm so there's glad not. you. I'm so glad you said that all because the money, man. as a dad, and all of us are dads in here. You know, it, that's a that's another one of those things that you could easily do. like. Not, like in my head, sometimes I think like nothing is more important than my wife and my son. Uh -huh. So like I want to be there. If there's free time, then that's where I should be. Yeah. It's my family. But it's like man. I'm, I'm doing pretty good as a dad. Like I'm very, very present and, and do a lot with my son. Like, you know, maybe that's as important or more important for me sometimes to be like, Hey hun, like you, you can you handle max by yourself? I'm going to go catch a, a coffee with Jason because yeah. he means a lot to me and so that and go spend that time every once in a while yeah. you know, or at least once a month. Right. With that person. Uh, and my son is not going to go, where was my dad that one time? You know what I'm saying? Like I missed out on when I'm present all the other times in his life. No, he'll be, he'll, open the door and he'll see you with a big smile on your face because you're you're still hmm. and he'll go running dad right and again it's not it's not all the time and by the way like some relationships just aren't going to be like two dudes like having coffee <laughs> it might be i've got my headphones on you got your headphones on let's go let's go lift hmm. hey will you help me solve a problem at my house Let's go fishing. Let's go hunting. We're not going to talk. We're just going to smell bad and sit next to each other and drink coffee. <laughs> like, let's go do some stuff. And right. so I'm not even saying that um, um, that you have to have this little kumbaya spirit. No, no, I get but it. But you have to. I love sitting down, talking shop, right? I, that's, that's one of my favorite things to do. Like, hey, have you read something? That's not for everybody. That's fine. You just We just can't say that's not important. Yeah, right? I mean, you know, not to go too much on a tangent, but, I, you know, this has always been hard for people. Um, it's not a new thing. I think what's happened is we've eliminated all of these structures um, and, you know, just things we've done in culture and society that, you know, were, were done on a weekly basis that always brought us together. And I think we might have taken that for granted. Like every, yeah. we have the whole town, you know, or the, the neighborhood goes to church on Sunday yeah. or everybody meets here at this particular time to do this thing or the guys after work always have a drink at the bar afterwards and they go home afterward or whatever. It's like we've eliminated all these things that we've done culturally for so long, probably because we took them for granted, didn't realize why we had them. Um, and we had them for a reason because it's hard. Well, and I always love to look for when people who have different political ideologies are speaking and they start saying the same thing. And so you can take <laughs> Esther Perel and Jordan Peterson both talking about we cut all the strings to a common story. We cut all the strings to this idea that for all of human history, everybody walked outside their tent and they hit the ground on both knees and looked up and said, dear God or gods or whatever, please rain or my family dies. And then 200 years ago, we figured out how to ship avocados from Guatemala in the middle of the winter. And we figured out how to turn a faucet and water comes out of our homes. And we got real arrogant. Like, this is all about me now. Like I'm the center of my universe, right? And if you follow all of the psychological theories, they're all self-actualization. Mm -hmm. Do this, get this, use this person for this, make sure you've got this, and then you can be that shining star in the center of the universe. If you go back and read some of the old theories, we're here. We're self-actualized. We have everything. Mm -hmm. And the, sen the self doesn't hold. It can't hold the center. It was never designed to hold the universe up. So you're talking about a series of practices. I think it's deeper than that. Mm. I think it's a common story, a common purpose. We're all living for fill in the blank. And that's gone. And the only thing we have left to live for is us. And as David Foster Wallace says, you start living for you as a being created to worship. You'll worship beauty and you'll never be beautiful enough. You'll worship money. You'll never have enough. You'll worship shiny things. It will never be enough shiny things. And you can't stop. Right. And so you have to circle back. That was the worst chapter to write. Choose belief. You have to decide I'm not the center of the universe and I'm going to submit to something bigger than me. I'm not going to prescribe it. You, your body is designed to not lead the charge alone. This, this, it's now starting to really make sense why we're so lonely. Uh, because oh, when you, when we you have look, no common purpose. Yeah. Cause if you look at everything, um, it's almost sounds silly at first. Like we got more money. We got more shelter. We got so much food. We have people everything. Are, Safety, yeah. everything. Yeah. yeah. And one step further, the idea that we all today could pull out our magic wand cell phones and the four of us could communicate to a million people right now. Mm -hmm. We could do that. That's insane. Evolutionarily. Like that doesn't make any sense. But that's not community. It's not a substitute. That's not, that's, that's, we're, we're communicating. We're not connecting. That's different, man. That is not, I know that I'm going to go in that room and do something hard and Adam's outside 
and he's got me if I if I don't make it. You, you know, I'm gonna different. tell you. I'm gonna tell you a story my dad told me when I was younger, and I didn't get it until I got older and had kids. So my dad grew up uh, very very poor in Sicily. Um, you know, a lot of siblings. They lived in like one room. You know, including the donkey. Uh, that my grandfather had. And this is true. true. Mm-hmm. This is true. Very poor. Well, I was going to say, that was a weird way to call it, talk to about his brother. But yeah, that's no, a real donkey. Yeah. A real donkey. Uh, yeah. When he was real, real young. No manger. Um, but and, yeah. You know, but and, 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 when they got older, and they Sal finally. Sal was born. <laughs> and Sal, the anointed one. Uh, I see what. But, but yeah, then, they, you know, then even eventually got older, but they still were poor, but they had like two bedrooms or whatever. So it's like all the siblings. Share. And I remember, uh, you know, he came to this country and him and, you know, and my, my mom built this middle class life for us. And there's four kids. And, we had like a, we all had our own rooms, uh, our own bedrooms, and we had a kitchen and we had a laundry room. And I remember my dad saying, "You know, I don't like big." Ha-. And it was a massive house; it was a normal track home, okay. But to him, it was like a lot. And he goes, "I don't like big houses. I don't like everybody having their own room." I said, "What do you mean?" He goes, "Man, when I was a kid, we were all together all the time. We were with each other. We had to learn how to." you know, who's going to use the bathroom and I got to sleep like this because you're sleeping on the same bed with me. And then, and he said, it just brought us all closer because now I feel like I come home and my, my son's up in his room, my other kid's over there, nobody's talking to each other. And I remember him pointing that out. And I remember thinking, well, you're so silly. Like, what are you talking about? This is so much better. I don't want to live in one, you know, one cement room and, you know, but it, it makes sense now. Yeah. I, I, it won't surprise me in 200 years. We look back and say the 300, 3,000 3, 3, square foot house where everybody's got a room. And you take that infant and you put him in a bassinet and you finally get him out of your room so you can get all of your sleep. So you can go out and make all of your money. And that infant's attachment is spun up all by themselves, right? And they're solving mm. for that. That won't surprise me. Uh, I think it'd be hard to find causal data now, but I think you're right. Yeah. I think you're right. Do you yeah. think we start going back that way? Do you think we're smart enough creatures that we, we start to connect the dots? Or do you think there's like a happy medium, maybe? I, I am a like a pathological optimist when That's it comes to something like I, <laughs> I think we here it is we, it's right in front of us we can solve it yeah i also am like a frustrated realist and usually it's everything falls down right first and <laughs> four families have to move into that 3000 square foot house yeah and you find out 20 years later that was the best years of our life right, right? Wow. and i hate that but if you look at type 2 diabetes we we kind of have a map we're not if you look at, you know, the anxiety and depression literature, now countries are quietly starting to say frontline is exercise first, and then we'll start doing other stuff later. Let's do that first. I think we have a lot of solutions right in front of us. They just don't make any money. How, how often, speaking of like anxiety, depression, ADD, all those, how often do you think we misdiagnose ourselves? Like it's really common. It's interesting how, how often you hear this now. And I didn't connect these dots till I actually heard someone else speak on this. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. You know what? Now that I think about it, I do hear this a lot where we say, I have anxiety. Ugh, I me. have depression. I have ADD. Like, oh, did someone diagnose? Like, no, I, I just, like you automatically jump to this conclusion and you, I almost identify with this oh. diagnosis yeah. and how one, how is that, is it as common as I think it is? And is it on the rise? And then how dangerous is it for you to do that? And then how empowering is it for you to like almost deny that? Well, so the, the diagnostic manual, let's take the DSM, right? It's the manual that has all the diagnostics in it. That manual is designed for a couple of, couple of things for researchers to talk to each other. We're going to study depression. So we're all going to have like this common, mm. Like, so we're all apples to apples, mm-hmm. right? If somebody has this much stuff for this period of time and these series of behaviors, we're going to call that depression so we can all study it. Cool. And it also became the way that clinicians talk to insurance companies so they could get paid. Mm. You got to stamp this guy with something and then show me what you're going to do over the next six to 12 weeks and I'll pay you for that, right? That became, that, that's the model. And then the internet happens and that diagnostic manual gets released to the wild and I can just Google it. And then I can say, oh, I've got this thing. You take that on top of a culture that's obsessed um, with being problem centric. Hey, my name is John. I've got bipolar disorder and I've got this. And this happened to me when I was a kid. Tell me about you. Instead it's so saying, true. Hey, yeah. We, yeah. We, that's how our culture approaches each other. How dare we say, hey, my name is John. And on most days, my wife likes me and my kids are healthy. Because <laughs> right. it's like, who do you think you are? Because yeah. we live in an age of cynicism and pessimism. That's our that's our currency. That's the air we breathe. And if you have joy and any sort of things are good right now, they won't be forever. But right now, they're good. Dude, 
oh, you must be privileged. You must be this. You must be. We have to come up with a whole narrative for why you're smiling right wow. now. Right. And the third thing is, um, man, Dr. Brewer talks about this eloquently. I'm a lot more crude. We identify ourselves with those stamps, with those labels. We're proud of them. Mm -hmm. I have a thing because if I have a thing, if you Google ADHD, I'm pretty sure my picture comes up. <laughs> if you Google OCD, I'm pretty sure my picture comes up, right? Sorry, boss. I can't be there at 830. I got ADHD. Like yeah. I can't get this thing in on time. I got anxiety. So I always tell folks, it's a context, not an excuse, man. And if I just look at my body acting anxious, ADHD kicking up, that's my body trying to get my attention. That's my body's response to chaos. That's my body's response to a lack of safety. Awesome. It also helps me be hyper-focused and be better than anybody at this particular task. It also helps me look out over the hill and see some a threat that might be coming. It can be a superpower too if I choose to reframe it that way. Yeah. And because I'm a guy who has pretty <laughs> gnarly time blindness, I get in the shower at 7.58 for an 8 o'clock meeting, and then I get out at 8.15 and I'm pissed that the clock just right kept, kept going. And uh, then I got a 45 minute drive and I get in it, you know, at nine and I'm so mad that at everybody else that they're mad at me that I missed it at the meeting. Um, it's up to me to get up an hour earlier. That's my job yeah. to have three alarms. That's, that's my work, right? It's not to say, I got this thing, guys. I can't, we can't do that anymore, man. Mm -hmm. We can't do that. It's a context. Is that real excuse. time blindness? Cause I've seen somebody use that as an excuse uh, at work for not showing up. It can never be an excuse. Yeah. It can't be an excuse. I do struggle. My wife has said, <laughs> <laughs> you experience time differently than the rest of us. Yeah. Um, I've, That's a new one for team me. Back so there, right? yeah, back they're they're probably they're all they're shaking right? I probably, um, if I was honest, it's like the cheapest, I mean, the, the chiefest form of disrespect in my life. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a choice to privilege myself and my time over that room of people waiting on me. Mm. And that makes me a scumbag, dude. I need to fix that. Mm -hmm. Right. So I can have all the diagnostics, all of this. It can't be an excuse. I want to ask you something because you just did something right now I, that I do all the time. Mm -hmm. And I re recognize that this could be a problem. You just said I'm a scumbag right now. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that's hilarious. And, I, I'll tell you if it is. But, um, but I do find that, sh that um, and I find this in health and fitness too, where the self-shame yeah. can actually become a driver in the negative behaviors as well. It can actually mm -hmm. fuel the fire. Let's talk about that for a second. Like, cause someone may be listening and be like, Oh my God, that's me. Mm -hmm. Holy cow. I do that stuff. And now I'm aware. Once you have the awareness of stuff that you do, that isn't so great. It's, I think it's normal and natural to be like, well, that sucks. I shouldn't do that. But how do we stop the shame spiral that then makes us keep doing it? Or yeah, that's, worse? that's, that's, that's a, that's a thing I need to work on. Yeah. I mean, my counselor's been after me. My family's been after me. The people ride into the show and they're like, Hey, we love your show, but dude, stop saying that you're an idiot. Like it, it kind of mm -hmm. debunks, it devalues our opinion of you because you're always talking, you're not treating yourself like you tell us to treat other people. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's a default setting. It's a, well, I suck. And I just, also, honestly, it's an excuse. Mm. It's a way to get out of a situation, right? Instead of sitting in that discomfort with my wife, I can go, I'm the worst. I suck. I'll figure it out. That's easier than saying, all right, tell me what happened. Tell me mm. how I made you feel last night that's a harder thing to sit in that. So it's easier. Just, it's just an off ramp, man. Yeah, okay. It feels like it's, it's, or at least for me, it was a, a, a default because of an insecurity more than anything else. Right. Like, it, like I All remember day. I would do the same thing and it was because mm -hmm. I felt inferior, insecure, right. I didn't finish college. I have, I'm around all these people that are really intelligent. So if I say I'm dumb, I, I can get to the, I can beat them to the You're punch. You're pulling their bullet out of their gun That's so right. they can't shoot you with it. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I already I, said it. I was notorious for that. Right, it took right. me a long That's time. That's like, uh, what's that, 8 Mile? Eminem does that, right? Yeah. He does it so yeah. good. Like, yeah. I'm all these things, and now you can't you yeah. can't rap against me. Except life's not a rap battle, right? <laughs> yeah. And, um, well, dude, you're the one that told me in a private conversation, and it was a it has echoed in a haunting way through my life. John, you cannot hate yourself to getting into better shape. Yeah. That will never work. I can't tell myself that I suck towards being a better dad because you know who wears that? My son will wear that. My mm -hmm. daughter will wear that because they will be the reason why I feel bad and need to fix myself. That's not their job, right? I need to say, dude, I love myself enough to do the things I need to do to give myself peace in this house 
because I love them that much, right? Yeah. And dude, this is I like, it's an embarrassing thing. Um, and I think, but it's important to say it out loud. All the education, all the success, all the whatever, change the family tree, all that stuff. Um, guys, this is six months ago. This this wound is still fresh. Mm. Um, the counselor that I work with, she's just she's incredible. But she said, I want you to make a fist. And so I did. And she said, put it in your chest like this. And she said, say the words, I love this guy. I started laughing. I was like, ah. And she's like, say it. I was like, nah, I ain't kind of. <laughs> Guys, I couldn't say it. Oh, wow. It was yeah. so bizarre. Oh, interesting. It was a weird, like, I couldn't even fake it. I like I'm on stages for a living. And I couldn't, like, theater my way through it. It was like, I'm not going to say, I can't, I'm not going to say that. And she goes, that's it. And she goes, you can do all this other stuff. You can have all these other admissions. You can do all the body work and EMDR, all this stuff. But your kids know that man doesn't love himself. Mm -hmm. He's unsafe. They know that. Mm -hmm. And so it has been a weird, in my church growing up, my religious tradition said, if you love yourself, that's sin, right? That's not right. Mm -hmm. My neighbors, and I'm, I'm saying neighbors, our community say, if you love yourself, that's narcissistic. That's, mm -hmm. no, man. That is you deciding I'm going to take care of myself so that I can repel off yeah. and go take care of my family, my neighborhood, my community, my country. I can only do that if I'm whole over here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had someone tell me about the whole, the dad thing that, uh, well, well, good dads don't ask themselves if they're good dads. <laughs> good dads don't look at themselves and, and try to improve. So, you know, cause I had that same issue. Like, uh, oh, I'm not a good dad. Mm -hmm. Good dads don't, you know, bad, bad dads don't say that. Oh, they themselves. don't ask that question. They don't yeah, ask that they, question. Yeah, they just said, bring more beer. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, you you came up with some in the book. You put down kind of a structure of things people can do every day yeah. to help them deal with anxiety and the things that cause anxiety, or at least the the, the relationships that we have with anxiety, to improve them. Can we go down the list of what yeah, they are? Yeah, and, yeah. Okay. Um, so I, what I try to do is this: try to create a roadmap that I could give to my thirteen year old. Hey, man, here's if you will do these things. If you'll brush your teeth and floss you're less likely to have bad breath. And if you do have bad breath, you probably have a tooth infection and you'll be able to know what that is and you can go to a doctor and get it solved, right? So that's the, that's the idea here. For my 13-year-old and for my buddies with two PhDs who are trying to achieve their way to peace, it's just not coming. Mm. The first one is you have to choose reality. And um, what does that mean? That mean you, we say it altruistically, we're in the attention economy. Mm. That's a bullcrap way to say that. We are in the distraction, look over here economy. Oh, yeah. And so, like you talked about earlier, it's hard to sit in your feelings. Well, Netflix, dude, they solve that. Yeah. Like you don't even have to, you don't even have to do this no more. They just start the next show for you. <laughs> I, and they, and by the way, I already know what you watch, and I know all the, the websites you go to. I know you better than you do. You're gonna want to watch this, and you're just like, all right, I'll watch that, right? Um, or all the distractions. So choosing reality is really saying, here's the starting line to my marathon. It's an inventory. What's the state of my marriage? It's like, hey, you tell somebody, go get a blood test. You tell somebody, let's do, let's see how much you can squat, see how much you can bench. Let's get a baseline so that we can then figure out where we need to go. That's what that is, man. And that's hard. It's terrifying. Because that means you sit down at the table and you say, like, I think she's cheating on me. I'd sit down at the table and saying, my kids can't be in this. They keep walking in the front door and slam the door and they go in the room and shut the door. And I laugh and I go, ah, oh, it's just teens. No, that means they don't, my relationship with my kids, I need to figure out what's going on, right? And so inventory is hard. Inventory is scary. Is it recommended that you do that alone in like yourself or that you involve a partner? That Because sometimes I would think that some people have a hard time even accepting their own reality or doing yeah. their own inventory. So is it recommended that you use a, a, a wife or a husband to support that or it's something you need to learn to do? I, I think it's similar to, um, I mean, you guys, I've all three of you behind closed doors. I've asked you questions about exercise. I've been working out for 30 plus years, right? But I still need a coach to get going. And then y'all gave me a roadmap. I use maps anabolic and y'all gave me a plan and a roadmap. And then I have your number. I can call you and check in if I need to. Right. But for me, a guy who knows all about exercise and about the physiology, I've been lifting my whole life. I started with a coach. I started with somebody. Okay. And so if you have a good marriage and you trust your partner not to be self-serving, well, like that's great. Some people need a, a coach. Some people need a therapist. I think you can start on a, on a yellow pad first and your body will let you know. Mm. Like, what's the state of your marriage? Oh, yeah. yeah. I need to have that conversation. I need to call somebody, <laughs> right? And if you can say, great, or not good, but we can 
we've worked it out before. That's right. So um, I think yeah, it's different for everybody. Okay. But I think you can never go wrong with okay with an objective third party or so that, second party. So that first step is really just like, okay, here's where I'm starting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Here's what's going on. What's the state of my life? That's it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Where do you go from? And by that, the way, and, by the way, that might be an event the first time you do that. If you've mm-hmm. never done that before, oh, I can only imagine, it can be overwhelming, right? right? You just get dropped in the ocean. Right. Once you get to shore, that becomes a 30-second check-in every day. How can I love you, honey? How can I love you today? I see. Right? How mm-hmm. can I love you today? You check your watch and see my heart rate variability is good. Like, I'm ready to rock and roll. My heart, it says, don't work out. I feel good. I'm going to go for it, right? You get to know your body. So over time, it becomes like this mm-hmm. really quick. And when something gets sideways, you know it, right? This is exactly how we communicate fitness. Well, it, it, you, the you the parallels a, you, are yeah. You do a, an assess a full assessment, a deep dive the first time to figure out all the imbalances and issues mm-hmm. and drivers for why you want to be fit. You dive into the cycle like you get a, a full check in, and then the diagnostics later on because you know all that stuff is just a quick check in. Is just like oh, mm-hmm. make sure I'm I'm moving or I'm addressing that. So very you guys, very you guys have trained people yeah. over time, especially the, the more elite of an athlete somebody is. And they'll tell you, hey, there's a weird thing in the side of my knee. And you watch them do one squat and you're like, oh, yeah. yeah you're like, you know. move your foot this way, right? Or whatever the thing is. And so you get really good. The the, the further along you take inventory, I mean, the more you take inventory, the better you get at yeah. it, right? Okay. Second one we talked about, you got to choose connection. There is no mental or physical or relational health or spiritual health on a platform of, yo, bro, you do this by yourself. You cannot do this by yourself. So you got to have some sort of, community some sort of person and by the way the data is jarring that the, the number of people and depends on 50 to 70 percent depending on what thing you read have no one to call zero like hey i gotta take my wife to the er in the middle of the night i got nobody hey my wife has no idea that i don't even believe in this church anymore my wife has no idea that i'm talking to somebody else that i'm struggling with our marriage and so you can be lonely in a crowded room. You can be lonely in a bed you share with somebody you've been married to for 20 years. You can be lonely in a lot of places, but you have to choose that connection. Sometimes you got to hire somebody, right? It's part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The data, by the way, I think you're familiar with the study that they compared being lonely to the health, health effects of smoking Smoke. 12 cigarettes a day yeah, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. How That's, much? It's 15, but oh, I mean, more than 12. Okay. So wow. Yeah. But it, it, like the, I think that's become the sound bite. Mm-hmm. I don't think we fully appreciate just how bad smoking is for you. Oh, yeah. Right? It causes all death, right? I mean, like, if you look globally, lung Every cancers, negative health thing gets- Lung cancer is the cancer, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just brutal, right? And um, so if you... It, I think attaching it to smoking makes everybody go, oh, but we don't do anything about it, right? Because, you know, I think saying... There's a, there's a link between loneliness and stroke and loneliness and heart attack and loneliness and cancer and loneliness and Alzheimer's. Just go down the list. And bigger than those things, because that's hard. Y'all know that. Like, hey, if you don't get that workout in, in 25 years, you might have a heart attack. People are like, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll get right on that. <laughs> um, there's something about, I want my son to walk in the door from eighth grade. And maybe we're the only ones that he walks in and he looks at me after a rough eighth grade day, whatever that even is. And he can't wait to tell me about it because I'm a safe landing spot. That to me, yeah. like, man, forget I, all the stuff downstream. We'll get there, but man. I remember when, so I went to um, uh, Yellowstone and we were in, uh, I think, Wyoming, right? Uh, that's one of the states where it goes through, I believe. And, and I was there with my wife and I was talking with people living there. And I was like, man, what a beautiful state. And there's all this open space. It's so great. And they were telling me about the state. And they said, oh, yeah, but one of the bad things, we have one of the highest suicide rates. I said, what? Yeah. How could that be? It seems so. And they said, well, a lot of people are so spaced out. They're lonely. Yeah. And they, they connected that to suicide. And I said, mm-hmm. holy cow, that's true. Because if you got people around you, they could, you know, kind of intervene or stop. You don't have to say anything. Yeah, they know yeah. what's going on. Someone could see you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you got to choose connection. The third one is um, you have to choose freedom. And I don't mean that in like the pew, pew, pew kind of way, right? <laughs> oh, I was just about to like, freedom. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. He, earlier when you were walking around in there with your American flag underoos on, like, like it's not, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's it's this about. idea, um, and it doesn't play well culturally, but who runs your life? Mm. And if a, like we said earlier, if a mortgage company tells you, like, you're going to work tomorrow, I don't care the state of your marriage, I don't care how you feel, you will go to work tomorrow because you owe me. I don't care, like, if, if you're, car dealership like you go to work tomorrow man i don't care if your boss is beating you down i don't care if 
you are under investigation, you will go to work because you owe me, right? Your body knows, they call it the nerd word is agency or autonomy. Your mm. body knows if you're in the backseat of your own life. And so if you look at what you owe, and it, it's controversial in a weird way because the part of your brain that's designed for rational thinking, man, if you have an interest rate of 2.9%, and I can put that cash in the bank right now and make 5% just in a, in a high yield savings account. Mathematically, it is stupid to pay off my house. I'm losing that right. gap. It doesn't make mathematical sense. It's dumb. And I call it a sleep tax or a soul tax. Your body knows someone could take our house. This isn't mine until it's mine. And so for me, that 3%, that's a, that's a simple, simple equation right it's not gonna make mathematical sense but that amygdala that's spinning you're not safe you're not safe you're not safe you're not safe what about this what about this what about this hmm. and if you just put yourself in that in that state of mind i got a co-worker she paid off her and her husband paid off 450 grand in student loans they lived in a one-bedroom apartment for seven years they said we dug this hole we didn't know we dug this hole they lived on an air mattress man they went all like wow. i mean they were like oh. they were all in. committed dude <laughs> um but this idea that you can't you can't. The government's got to bail you out. You can't. You're too stupid. You're too stupid. We got to come bail you. It's this idea that you're so incapable. Someone will got to come rescue you, right? And you can you extend it out one step further, like freedom from your calendar, right? We talked about that. Freedom from uh, an abusive boss. Freedom from a mother-in-law mm -hmm. still telling you what you do every Christmas. Like whether you can afford it, whether your family's exhausted, whether this is the year to travel. You're coming to Christmas in Nebraska. I don't care who you like. All right, I gotta go to Nebraska. A few years ago, my wife and I started in September. We send an email out to our families and we say, here's what we're gonna do for Christmas. And we'd love it if y'all joined us. Or we're gonna be in your part of the country on this day. If y'all wanna do presents that day, that's awesome. And if it doesn't work for y'all, great. And it's been such a gift hmm. because we don't spend money we don't have to drive to a place we don't wanna be and show up pissed off at our family's house. And I'm mad that they invited me. We just say, hey, we're not going to make it this year. And there's some tension and some regret and some guilt, but man, it just adds peace. And so it's choosing freedom. Who is telling you what you're going to do in your own life that next mm. day? Um, the next one is choosing, we talked about mindfulness. And when I think of mindfulness, I think of two things, man. Curiosity and awareness. I'm about to do this thing. Why am I about to do this thing? My wife just left those wet towels in the floor. We just talked about that yesterday. I can just start the story machine up. She did that because she just just doesn't appreciate me, doesn't respect me. That, or I can think, dude, we just talked about this. For her to do that again, I can't imagine what happened in this in this house today while I was gone at work. I'm gonna pick up those towels and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get the dishes too. One of those avenues leads to divisiveness and brokenness and stroke and heart attack, mm. and one of those leads to peace and empathy. I get to pick which story I make up, man. I get to pick that track. Um, and maybe she did do it on purpose. This isn't the moment to invent that. It's later on that evening when I say, hey, the story I'm making up is you just left those towels on the floor, man, just to piss me off. And she can be like, I did that, right? We need to, we need to talk about that. Yeah. Or she'd be like, no, man, I'm so sorry. The kids were vomiting everywhere and then this happened, this happened. Man, what a different way to live, right? So it's just choosing that. I keep reaching for a drink. What is it about that? Or I keep hiding. I keep heading straight to the toilet, man, and just sitting on there, pretending I'm taking a dump and I'm just scrolling for hours, right? Why would I rather be in here in a place where my poo-poo and pee-pee go <laughs> than out with my kids? That doesn't sound right. That doesn't feel right. And so just being um, mindful and then health and healing, you all know that. You got to deal with your old traumas. You got to get your body in a place where it can operate well. Otherwise, it'll try to get your attention. And that last one is choose belief, man. You got to take a knee to something bigger than you. Hmm. And that's super unpopular. Mm -hmm. Wow. Did, when you, when you were dealing, cause you said, you know, when you were, you, you wrote this book, you were doing stuff for yourself through this process. Yeah. How, um, how was that journey doing both at the same time? Did, was it, I mean, it, it must've felt very personal, but also very cathartic or torturous. <laughs> both. <laughs> yeah. So here's the, um, I've talked about this in a few other interviews and I don't want to beat the story to death, but, um, my big dirty secret was, uh, and I think you and I, you may have been the first guy I told just privately behind closed doors. My big dirty secret was 
here I have this show, a mental health guy. I've been doing this forever. Sit with parents and marriages, whatever. My daughter wouldn't hug me. Mm. Mm. She's four, five, and six. And at first it was funny. It was like her little like, gotcha. And then all little kids are trying to grab power in their homes. Mm -hmm. And so it became like, ooh, dad wants a hug. I can hold that, right? But then it turned into a thing. And then I would find myself, I'm embarrassed to say, I would find myself crying on the way to work because mm -hmm. my wife would give me a hug. My son would come up and hug me and I'd hold my son's face and I'd say, hey, I love you. And I'm so grateful I get to be your dad. And he'd say, thanks, dad. And he'd be like, oh, dad. But I knew. And then I'd reach down to hug my daughter and dude, she would do this Barry Sanders move <laughs> and dive and turn. And I'd get in my car and I'd be like, yeah, go do a uh, mental health and parenting show with the guy that uh, one of your daughter won't even hug you. Mm, wow. And it became a bigger and bigger deal in my house. And it was my wife that finally said, hey, you're always talking about neuroception, right? This, that scanning that your brain is doing 24-7, 365, is this safe? What if that little girl's body has identified the man who tells her every day that you love her, every day that she's brilliant, that she's beautiful, that she can do anything? What if she's identified you as not safe? And I was like, dude, I don't scream. I don't hit my kid. Like, I don't do any of that stuff. It doesn't matter. She said, John, I can feel that nuclear reactor here. And that's what sent me to sit down with somebody and say some stuff out loud I'd never said ever. And a professional, right? Mm -hmm. And that led the, mm -hmm. whew, I'm not living some of this stuff. I am. I got real busy and I made different kinds of money and I got this big best-selling book, all these stuff that I said I wanted. And here I am nine months later and I'm super lonely again. I'm not hanging out with my buddies anymore. I'm not calling people back. Um, I'm not eating right anymore. I'm starting to skip workouts. I'm ignoring my wife when I get home because I'm checking Instagram to see how many followers we got that day. Like it just happened and it happened and it happened. And um, a couple of weeks ago, I said a sentence. It came out of my mouth and I've never said this sentence. And it was, will you get off me? Because now I'm like a human jungle gym to that. Oh, program, wow. Right? Wow, that's amazing. Literally nothing changed except I decided to deal with the nuclear reactor. I sat down with my wife and said, hey, we have to make a regular practice of connection, us and with our friends. I have to be intentional about our money. I have to be intentional about these other things. I have to quit pretending that the world revolves around me. It doesn't, man. I got to go back and figure out faith again for me. What's that look like for our house? What's that look like for me? What's that look like for you? And my body goes, oh, you're driving again. Whew. Right. And it happens faster now because I've been doing this for so long. Right. Similar. If you got out of shape, you could get back because you know the steps, sure. you know the pain, you know how to get there. But I tell you what, man, having a daughter that now goes off the top ropes when I'm walking upstairs and hangs on real tight. It's a it's a, it's a different kind of deep breath. Right. And so you can talk about money and talk about success. Dude, I want my daughter to give me a hug when I get home. Yeah. It's so wild how something that isn't like connected to her per se is what made all the difference. It was something you had to fix internally. That has nothing really to nothing. do with her to change that complete. She was the alarm system. Yeah. That's letting so, me that's know so, that I'm not all right. How many dads or, and moms have that, you know, there's some disconnect with the kid or something's going on and they swear it's like this conversation they need to have with the kid or there's something that the kid isn't doing or they're not doing with that. And it's like, no, there's something inside of you. You got to fix and believe it or not, they can they can feel it or oh, sense man. it. Whether they even consciously know they are. Well, my my and my wife, this is about a year ago, she said, What if you like you want your kids to like you? What if you worked hard at being likable? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, stop the crazy, right? But like, what if every interaction with my children wasn't like this life lesson that they have to learn? And what if every time my 13-year-old did a 13-year-old thing? I didn't treat him like he was a 35 year old employee of mine, mm. but I was like, man, we can't, we're not going fishing until you get that done, man. Yeah. Like, like I love you. You can listen to your country music and do whatever. Like, well, we're not going to go. What if I didn't lecture my daughter every time she came out and her hair was sideways or what, what if I was just a likable guy? Mm. And that doesn't mean I don't hold my kids accountable. That doesn't mean that I don't have standards and values. That means that I'm going to default to let's play dominoes together over a lecture. I'm going to, default to dude every interaction is not this roi Listen, it's not a yeah. it's not an investment in the future net worth of my kids yeah. intelligence yeah. and morality 
Bro. I, Be likable. I, like got, I got to comment on this because uh, a lot of got, a lot of men listening right now can. This is resonating because a lot of us didn't have that kind of relationship with our. That's where you learn it, right? You have it with your dad, and so like I feel awkward with my, especially my teenage kids. How do I connect with the, my daughter? She's thirteen. What are we going to talk about? Like, ah, what do I do? I don't know what to, you know. Whatever. And my wife was like, just have her put her phone down, and you guys just sit there quietly while you're driving. Yeah. She's like, that's all you got to do and create yeah. space. <laughs> and it's, I swear to God, it worked. It works just opening the space. So I think one of the great curses of modern masculinity is that men think they only have value when they have utility. 100%. And we only think we have utility when we have all of the answers or the checklist or the right tool in the toolkit. And it took me a long time to realize my wife, like academically, she's way smarter than me. She was Dr. Deloney before I was. She's published before. She's smart. She doesn't need my answers on how to solve this problem. <laughs> hmm. She just wants me. Mm -hmm. She said it the other night, and, and I, I, I told her, I was like, if you had said that sentence 20 years ago, I think my life would be different. She just said, hey, I know you want to go to bed. Can we watch a lame show? I need to borrow your nervous system. Oh, wow. Cool, and she curled up next to me like a, like a puppy and leaned in real close. There was nothing sexual about it. It was just... Zzz. And we watched some stupid show for 30 minutes and she literally got up and was like, ah. Instead of, in the past, she'd say, I just want to spend some more time with you. All right, what, what do we need to do? What do we fix? Can we solve this? Like, what's, what's challenging? Oh, your heart rate's messed up? All right, here's what we're going to do. You need to take this supplement. You need to do this. Dude, I just need you. I just need you. I'm so uncomfortable without having utility, totally. without having like a list, right? Our kids are the same way, man. Uh, Gabor Mate wrote a book with his child psychiatrist that I didn't know existed. He was like my favorite writer. And I, 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 the name of the book escapes me, but essentially it's this idea that your kids' peers are their most important influence. That is not evolutionarily the right way. That happened when we all left the farms and went to the factories and dumped our kids in a schoolhouse and said, y'all co-manage each other. That's not normal. Kids are wired internally to want to be connected to the adults that love them. And so if your kid is more interested in their kids, I mean, their friends, that's not a normal, like, ah, it's just the way it happens when they're teenagers. No, man, they're filling a gap. Mm -hmm. And so that means I got to learn how to connect with my kid. That's my mission. And by the way, there was no YouTube a few years ago. And then they were like, hey, we should probably learn how to do YouTube. And everybody figured it out. Similarly, I don't know how to connect with my ninth grader. Well, that's the that's the goal. That's the next that's the next mission, right? I'm, it's more important than figuring out YouTube, right? I'm so glad yeah. you said that. I'm so tired of people telling me how my relationship with my son is going to be when he gets to be a teenager because of what, how teenagers are. And it's like, nah. I'm not going to create that same story for myself. Yeah, I, right. I think that's, and it's unfortunate that we've defaulted to that. We just, oh, they're going to be this age. It People have been telling me that since hook. he was born. It lets you hmm. off the hook. Yeah, that they're going to be a certain way when they get to this age. And it's like, nah, yeah, I, I, I get to create common, that. Common doesn't mean good. I mean, it's it's common for people to be unhealthy. That doesn't mean it's good. And is there is there is there literature about how there's, there's a, a, a separation? Yeah. But that separation is in autonomy. That separation is, yeah. I have my own it's thoughts. It's going to be there. No matter, yeah. It's not that I'm not anchored into some man who loves me no matter what. You know, what you said about utility really hits me because I'm like that. Like, And I had this huge epiphany with my wife recently where she gets migraines sometimes. Really, really bad. Terrible mm -hmm. migraines. So bad that she's, you know, on the couch covering her head and you know, she's got ice, the whole deal. And when that would happen, I'd... You know, give her some meds, give her some water, and I get up and do all the shit in the house. I'm gonna clean, I'm gonna clean, I'm gonna make sure everything's done. So she's a, and uh, recently she had a migraine, and I just sat with her and did none of those things. And she's like, "That's what I want you to do when I have a migraine. I don't want you to do all this stuff. I, I'm here trying to be useful and do things. She's like, I just want you to sit with me while I feel like shit. And I'm like, well, that's really uncomfortable for me, but I think that's what you need. <laughs> okay, let's do this. And that's where, like, not to get cheesy, that's where my like mindfulness comes in yeah i'm sitting on the couch i have my hand on my wife's bare calf i'm just holding her and i'm watching tv and i'm like i want to go do something i'm gonna like oh i didn't get my workout in i gotta go i just be curious why why am i so uncomfortable sitting with this woman who said i do mm. like i need to solve that's the problem to solve it's not her it's not the work 
That's the problem. Let's figure that out. John, how how um, how important is it to be comfortable being alone and not distracted? This one is really, really hard for me. Yeah, there's a big difference between loneliness and solitude. Mm. Solitude is a spiritual practice. That's important. Right. Man. Having a season. And again, uh, I think it's something to be curious about. And I think it's something you practice. I was highly uncomfortable being by myself without headphones, without noise, without yeah. some sort of distraction. Now, man... And I, th and I think, <laughs> you know, I think that's what fishing, I think it's what hunting, I think it's what lifting is, mm -hmm. is solitude. And we have to wrap it around an activity, which that's fine. But finding a way to be by yourself. And if you're uncomfortable with that, I, like, what is it about me I don't like? What is it about me I'm so uncomfortable with? You know, it's funny you just mm -hmm. said that. So, so our listeners will like, I, I brought this up before, but I was watching uh, Pumping Iron. I've seen it a billion times. Okay. It's a great documentary. Arnold Schwarzenegger, the whole deal. And, and I've watched this so many times that I'll notice things in the background. Uh, I'll notice that piece of equipment or that guy working out over there. And then I noticed something that uh, that I hadn't noticed before. This was maybe a couple of years ago. There was no music playing in the background of the gym. So back then, they didn't start adding music until later. Back then, you'd go to the gym and you would hear just weights clanging and people counting reps. Uh, and I thought, oh, that's weird. That's interesting. So I experimented with it with myself. First, I took my phone away, which... I'll do that in between sets, right? Oh, got to post something. Got to learn this thing for the podcast. Put that away. And then I did it without trying to really listen to music. Totally different experience. I was much more present in the moment without any other distractions other than the workout and then the rest in between sets. And I find if I've got like Slayer or old Bad Brains <laughs> playing, I'm a little more amped. Yeah. And like I get, I don't want to say I get a better pump, but like my workout's hard. Mm-hmm. But if I don't have any, like, I, and I do it intentionally, if I don't have any music playing, it's a slower, more meditative lift, and it's different. It doesn't leave me like, yeah, snap into a Slim Jim. <laughs> but I walk out, having worked out hard, and I walked out a little more peaceful as I enter back in. You did house. a work in. A what? A work a in. Work, work in. out, yeah. work in. I didn't invent that, by the way. Yeah, yeah, Paul Check taught us yeah, that. Paul I was going to say, dude. That's great. We, what profound. we do talk about, though, all of us share how uh, I think there's tremendous value in like different music for different mindsets going into a lift. Oh, like, yeah. There's a time to put Slayer on and go rip that bar up <laughs> off the ground, yeah, right? exactly. And then there is a time to put Inya on yep. and just, you know, <laughs> meditatively work through your... It's an your, <laughs> Don't listen to Inya. He does. Time. You were listening to Avril yeah. Lavigne. Yeah. 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 That's he different. Was but boy. no, I, I, I definitely have... Uh, I listen to all... I love all music in general, but I definitely have different genres for the what I, my body needs. And sometimes okay, it, I think that's what you just said. I don't want the audience to miss that. That is so highly intentional and you have done the work to be so in tune with your body and you ask yourself the question, what do I need right now? Mm -hmm. Most of us don't. We, right. we are a slave to the calendar. We're a slave to what we owe. We got to go. What do I need right now? What does my family need this holiday season? That question, that should be the path, man. Yeah. And if you get like, you sit with a UFC fighter, like, as they're leading up, if, if you know those dudes, like they're amped, but they're super weirdly peaceful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Strangely peaceful. And it's like, no, I'm going to go get in a fist fight with a guy. I'm nervous. I'm going to be on a stage. I can get embarrassed. I can get hurt. But they're not anxious because they put the work in. They're in the driver's seat. So it's not about not going into hard stuff. It's about I'm driving. Yeah. It's not about I'm about to do, do a crazy hard workout. I'm going to need a little extra juice today. So I'm going to take this supplement. I'm going to put bad brains on. I'm going to turn up a little too loud to where it's, my mm -hmm. ears are going to ring because I'm doing this thing today. Yeah. But if it's every day, just, 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 just man, over time, your body starts to go, dude, I'm out. I, I'm out. You're not listening to us. Have you so seen how the do I explain? Okay. Just for reference to, they give me crap all the time because I listen to so much heavy metal. Yes. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's even it's at six o'clock, six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> heaviest to heavy. Oh, you get there's, in this car. It I connects get the two different and, effects from it. Right. Uh -huh. I can get the amped and I can get the, uh, like PR sort of lifting mm -hmm. kind of phase with that too. But also it's very relaxing for me. It very much calms me down. It, it gets so me in like a nice focused zone. See, so he says, so, it so really does. Like it's My uh, guess is that there comes a point, you know, I was telling you earlier, and I don't want to make this a diagnostic thing, so I'm just using this as an example, but depression and anxiety are on the same trend line. Eventually, your body tries to get your attention so much and you're not hearing it, it shuts the system off, right? It shuts it down and you can't get out of bed. Like, we're going to stay here under these covers, oh, right? I see. And so 
my guess is making this up. And I'm a guy that, dude, I would listen to it 24-7, 365 too, man, until I found the Avid Brothers and then my life kind of changed a little bit. But um, I wonder if you can you push it so hard so that your body hits the off switch and that's that relaxation. Mm -hmm. And I would wonder, is there a way to get to that without having to like, right. I earned the sort of that rest. Uh, it's not even that you forced the rest forced it instead okay. of, hmm. instead of working into it. Yeah. You worked out your body did that as a reaction to lamb of God over at six thirty five in the morning. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> true story, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is true story. We gotta, yeah, we gotta, he can't eat dairy right now. Now we're going to tell him this about metal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One Next thing is going to be no caffeine. Time, just, one thing we, we need our host. Crying. We need our host. We can't, <laughs> host. <laughs> you guys. can't just rip everything out for me that I love. <laughs> you know, back to the, uh, the uh, calm and, and, you know, uh, athlete. I don't know if you've, have you seen the studies around uh, when they've compared like some of the most like, you know, the Steph Curry's, the, the downhill skier, like, like their heart rate in yeah. those moments. That's the one common thread amongst like all sports in these crazy, what we would think like freaked out, scariest moments of life. Their heart rates Ooh. are like our resting heart rates yeah. mm -hmm. in the middle of a game, in the middle of an NBA game, game on the line, Calm. championship, about to shoot a free throw to win. The thing that separates those super, superstar athletes is their heart rate is like resting. So in those I, moments, how my, wild is that? Well, my dad was, a, like, it doesn't surprise me at all. And I, 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 the nerd in me wants to know, is that just because Steph Curry is the guy that's in the gym until 4 a.m. taking shots and it's so rote at that point? Or is there a, another mechanism that he has a thing we don't have right? Mm -hmm. that just downshifts? Um, my dad was, I think we've talked about this before. My dad was a homicide detective and a SWAT hostage negotiator. So if somebody in, in the city of Houston had a bomb, they'd call my old man and he had a mustache. He was a little big guy and he would, kind of walk out and sit by you and be like, Hey man, what are, like rough day? Huh? Like he was that guy. He talked to you on the phone or if you're going to jump off a, a building, he'd be that guy. But also he was a homicide detective. So he walked into situations where there's brains everywhere and there's bodies and all that. And so when I started doing crisis work with the police department and I would go in the evenings, we just had a cell phone and it would just say 1087 and an address and we show up 1087 was just a police code for a dead body. And we show up it could be a four-year-old. It could be a 40-year-old. It could be a 98-year-old, right? And occasionally, if it was a child, usually we'd get a heads up as a kid. And there's you, you got to be there. So mom, because mom's on her way, that kind of thing, right? And that was my job was to intercept mom before, the, you know. I remember leaving a house one night. At, I mean, the, the wildest thing you can imagine. Um, all, and, and I don't want to over sensationalize it for your viewers, but there was a police officer. Mom was coming in and the daughter was there and there was... The son had passed away and daughter said, you will not keep my mom out of this house. And the police don't want to arrest somebody in that situation. And my job would be to meet a, a mom in the front yard and say, you do not want to go in the house. Oh. You don't want that to be the last picture of your son. Ugh. Let's let the last time you talk to your son be the last. Right. So that's the conversation. And she said, you will not keep my mom out of this house. I'm mm -hmm. telling you right now, she will go to jail. It's going to be a mess. Mm -hmm. And so the police officer pulls out a pair of gloves and he hands them to me and he puts his on. He goes, it's you and me right now, buddy. And we went into the back. And then I met, and we took care of that situation so that the medical examiner could get in and get that body and get that guy out so that when mom showed up, it wouldn't be such a oh, explosive man. situation. It was a madhouse. But I met mom and everything went. Poof. And I called my dad the next day and said, hey, what are you, what am I supposed to do if after 20 years of sitting with students who were suicidal or their parents had just died or whatever, like they're kicked out of college or whatever. And now I'm doing this stuff too in the evenings. What do I do if everything slows down for me in those moments? I think that the thing I'm put on earth to do is to give people really bad news in a graceful way. And he said, be really grateful. You found your thing. You found your purpose and you make sure you do it real well because you honor people, right? And so I think all of us will eventually find that thing that time just slows down when I'm in this, you know, it's that flow state, right? But time slows down for yeah. me in this particular mm -hmm. thing. And I don't know if it's 20 years of reps or I don't know if it's just Jeanette. I, who knows what it is, man? I'm sure there's somebody trying to figure that out. But I think it might be when I'm sitting with somebody and they are struggling with a lift and they finally get it. And it's, oh my gosh, time's up. This session's over right? We were already burned through this session. I was so lasered in with this person, whatever it is. I think we all have that. Yeah. Somewhere. I think, it, I think it's probably a cross section of all that, right? Probably, yeah. It's probably something that's genetically, some people probably can get into it faster than others. It's also probably something you absolutely love to do. You lose 
the, you lose time right. in it, you know what I'm saying? And then you're gifted and you're good at it and you've also practiced it. In our culture, we give uh, <laughs> we give guys who can uh, make shots, we give them bajillions of dollars, man. And we give those who put on mm. bulletproof vests, we give them dozens of dollars, right? But, <laughs> but I mean, and, and I think we put an economic value on it that yeah. is is not indicative of the worth right? Mm, or yeah. how important it is. But John, yeah. what, what's your favorite thing about what you do? Cause you're, you're, you, you know, you have a show very popular. You talk yeah. to people, you've written this book. What's, what's your favorite thing about all this? My favorite thing is, um, I think it's two things. One, it is painting a picture of providing a model. I think most people want to do better. Most people want to feel better. They want to f- not hurt as much. They want to be better parents. They want to figure out what their finances to be better, whatever that is. There's just not a roadmap. There's no picture of what that looks like. And there's a bunch of dudes on Instagram yelling at them or there's what their dad did or didn't do. And that's the, that's their map. And so I love being able to say, here's a picture of something else. Here's three dudes that are my friends that are as yoked as you can possibly imagine. And they're really working hard to be great dads. And they're like good guys behind closed doors. And they have struggles too. It's all of it. Like, and there's something about showing that picture, which I think is awesome. The mm-hmm. second thing is I, I can't think of a higher honor um, than somebody walking in and saying, I don't know what to do next. Can I tell you the worst thing that just happened to me? And not saying, oh, I know what to tell you, but it's here's grab a nacho and pull up a seat and I'll sit here with you. And I think that, that's my favorite part is getting in the mud. Awesome. I wanna, S- Similar I wanna- to somebody coming in and saying, I'm tired of feeling this way. Like, will you help me in the gym? And you're like, I got you. Right. There's something, there's something holy about that. For sure. Yeah. I want, I want to go back to, um, your open wound, not to throw salt on it or anything, but I, I do think that there's a uh, tremendous value potentially there for a, a lot of, uh, parents that have struggled with connecting with their, their son or their daughter and thinking it probably is something they're doing. They need to do physically with them. And it's something they need to work mm-hmm. internally can you tell me like, like I doubt it was like a, you went to therapy one time, you made that connection. And then the next day she was all over you. Yeah. Was there, what was the, what was the process like? And how did you know, like you were on the right track? Mm-hmm. Because, were there like little baby steps in that direction? Yeah. Like, tell me how that unfolded. Um, so I'll just speak for my daughter. Um, when she was really young, when she was four or five, she was teeny tiny and I'm a big guy. And I had muscles. And so she didn't want to hug me. You're, we're hugging, right? And she would get real stiff and try to fight me. And she's a hurricane, man. So she would be like, Dad! And <laughs> throw punches. I mean, she's hilarious when it comes to that. And when it's four, it's cute and funny. Um, and it was my wife who one day, again, I feel like I'm always, my wife's just like this Yoda character in my life. But she was <laughs> like, you know, uh, you're just teaching her that um, regardless of what her body feels, that one day some guy who's bigger than her and can physically out muscle her, can have his way oh, with her body. And I was oh, like, man. that ends right now, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was like, she will know from her old man he respected it, right? So yeah. I was like, I ain't doing that. So um, that led to a season of nothing. Overcorrection, right? probably, yeah. To like, oh, yeah. And I way overcorrected, way overcorrected. What I entered into, I wish I had a better word for this, but I'm begin courting my daughter. I'm safe. And so what that meant was I'm not going to chase you when you run. We're playing, of course. We're playing tag, of course. But when I walk in the door and I say, hey, baby, how was today? And she walks away. I'm not chasing her. I'm going to go sit down and be a dad that's a dad of peace. Even in, inside, I'm like, golly, that sucks. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to let her feel I'm a safe presence in this chair while I'm reading a book, while I'm talking to her mom. I'm going to treat her mom so well. And I talked to my wife. She's going to watch how you receive me when I get home. And you and I have been together for 25 years, quarter of a century. We already have it figured out. You Can you be overly demonstrative for the next few months? When I come in, can you make it a point to give me a hug when I walk in the door? Can you make it a point to grab my face and say, I love you. I'm glad you're home. Um, Cause that's going to teach her. That's going to, that's going to show a picture for mm-hmm. my daughter, but it was a, it was a season according. And then it was when she finally would say, dad, can I get a piggyback ride? I'm so tired. Yeah. I'm going I'm I'm to make space for this. Hey, can I read you a book tonight? No, mom's going to do it. Can I read you a book tonight? No, I keep showing up and showing up. Too many adults let their kids hurt their feelings. My kids don't have permission to do that. I haven't given them access to my feelings. Yeah. They, um, I don't want them to feel that responsibility that if I say this thing, dad gets X, Y, Z. So I worked really hard to not let my daughter hurt my feelings. 
She's a seven-year-old little girl. She trusts her body. I want to teach her that that's okay. And that comes at a cost. That means dad is going to say, okay, and I'm going to leave. And she's going to begin to feel that gap. And so it was everything. Just keep showing up, keep showing up, keep showing up, keep showing up, keep courting, keep being a safe place. Hey, I'd love for you to go to breakfast with me in the morning. No, dad, I got to be on school. I'll take you. All right, dad. And we make that not a, all right, what are the five things you're going to do today? Yeah. But a, I'm just going to bring a coloring book and let's both color. We don't have you talk that much. And then 15 minutes into coloring, it's like, dad, there's this boy. And now we're off to the races. Yeah. Right. But it's a, it's a very anti-John program. Because <laughs> I want like, what's maps yeah. anabolic? Right. How many squats? Yeah. And what's the order? And how much time? Yeah. And have you heard Slayer's new record? Let's do this. Yeah. It's it's the opposite of everything I know. So did it feel like painfully slow as you were going through it, or and and or did you have this moment where like literally like you were like oh my god, we've we, we've broke through or we've made progress where you're celebrating with your wife? I mean, do you remember? I'll, I'll tell you how my buddy Trevor explained it. So um, the first time this is back in 2012 when my buddy who's a doctor said I think your alarm systems are so jacked up you've ignored them for so long they got to re be recalibrated you need some medicine for a season. And I, dude, I was crying at my kitchen table. I failed my family. What a loser. I'm not taking meds, that whole thing. And I called my buddy who had taken them. And he said, dude, you think you're going to wake up tomorrow and just be not depressed and be like, yeah, he's just not how that works. He tore his bicep when he was lifting and it rolled up on him and he went and got it surgically reattached and had to go through all that painful everything. Mm -hmm. And he worked in a print shop as a salesman. And he said, he went back to the shop like nine months later, back to the back. And a box started to fall and he reached up and grabbed it. And he said, I grabbed it. It didn't hurt. Huh. And he's like, I didn't realize all the therapy, all the stuff. And all of a sudden, then it presented itself. And so for me, I didn't, it was so, the, the steps were so minuscule. I didn't realize it until I was like, will you get off me? And then I uh. thought, I said, get off me. Mm -hmm. That means that she's on me so much that I'm like, golly, right? And so it was this, it was a moment that I realized, oh, look how far we'd come. Oh, that's right. cool. But I think if we over, I think we over measure, man. I think we over obsess. We don't look at trend lines. We look at the, what's the market do today? What's mm -hmm. it doing this minute? What's it doing this minute? Let's look what it's done the last year. What's it in the last month? What's it in the last hundred years? Let's give ourselves a picture of what that looks like. You can see a lot more with the trend than you can with this obsession. It's with a long game. Yeah, mm -hmm. man. 100%. Yeah. John, it's always awesome. Heavy awesome. on the show. I always feel like I get so much out of talking with you just from these podcasts and, and before and after. So I really appreciate you coming oh, here, man. Dude, I appreciate you guys. Yeah. And I, I everybody's got to get your book. It's, it's so, um, so valuable. Everything you talk about, I think is so valuable to everybody who's listening right now. So, so important right now. We're so important. A lot. Let me say this and y'all probably gonna edit this out. So please don't. <laughs> um, it's important for people who listen, especially in an age where there's such a gap between who people are behind closed doors and who they are like, with their song and dance routine. Like, thank y'all for being guys that I call and say, can you help? Right. Thank you for being guys that like, I see something funny. And I first person I think of is Justin. Like there's of all the people I know in the world, he'll think this is funny because <laughs> he want he likes this and this and this. And I do too. Thank y'all for being guys that are who you say you are behind closed doors. And that in this world, y'all know how rare that is. Yeah, yep. And so for your listeners, it's important to know that these guys really say they are. So thank you all for that. Yeah. Uh, like it means the world to me. I appreciate that. It's a huge compliment. Thanks. Thanks, yeah. Sean. For your hospitality.